Chapter Three of Perkins of Portland by Ellis Parker Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Adventure of the Lame and the Halt. I had not seen Perkins for over two years when one day he opened my office door and stuck his head in. I did not see his face at first, but I recognized the hat. It was the same hat he had worn two years before, when he put the celebrated Perkins patent porous plaster on the market. Pratt's hats air the hair. You will remember the advertisement. It was on all the billboards. It was Perkins, Perkins of Portland, Perkins the Great, who conceived the rhyme that sold millions of the hats and Perkins was a believer in advertising and things advertised, so he wore a Pratt hat. That was one of Perkins' foibles. He believed in the things he advertised. Get next to a thing, he would say. Study it. Learn to love it. Use it. Then you will know how to boom it. Take Murdoch's soap. Perkins of Portland boomed it. He bought a cake, used it used it on his hands, on his face, on his feet, bought another cake, washed his cotton socks, washed his silk tie, washed his woolen underwear, bought another cake, shaved with it, shampooed with it, ate it. Yes, sir, ate it. Pure soap, no adulteration, no taste of rosin, cotton seed, no taste of anything but soap, and lots of that spit out lather for a month every time i sneezed i blew a big soap bubble perspired little soap bubbles tasted soap for a year result greatest ad of the nineteenth century murdoch soap is pure soap if you don't believe it bite it picture of a nigger biting a cake of soap on every billboard in u s a live niggers in all the grocery stores biting cakes of murdoch soap five hundred thousand tons of murdoch sold the first year i use no other and so from his go lightly shoes to his pratt's hat perkins was a relic of bygone favorites in dress the result was comical but it was perkins and i sprang from my chair and grasped his hand Perkins, I cried. He raised his free hand with a restraining motion, and I noticed his fingers protruded from the tips of the glove. Say, he said, still standing on my threshold, have you a little time? I glanced at my watch. I had twenty minutes before I must catch my train. I'll give you ten minutes, I said. Not enough, said Perkins. I want a year but I'll take ten minutes on account. Owe me the rest. He turned and beckoned into the hall, and a small boy appeared carrying a very large glass demijohn. Perkins placed the demijohn on a chair and stood back gazing at it admiringly. Great, isn't it? he asked. Biggest demijohn made, heavy as lead, fine shape, fine size, but say, read that. I bent down and read. The label said, On a Towashitika water, bottled at the spring, Perkins and Company, Glaubus, Iowa. I began spelling out the name by syllables. Ah, no, to, what, when Perkins clapped me on the back. Great, hey? Can't pronounce it? Nobody can. Great idea. I got old Hunyadi Janos water knocked into a cocked hat. Hardest mineral water name on earth. Who invented it? I did. Perkins of Portland. There's money in that name. Dead loads of money. Everybody that can't pronounce it will want it. And nobody can pronounce it. Everybody will want it. Must have it. We'll weep for it. But that isn't the best. No, I inquired. No, shouted Perkins. I should say no. Look at that bottle. Look at the size of it. Look at the weight of it. Awful, isn't it? 
staggers the brain of man to think of carrying that across the continent nature recoils the muscles ache it is vast it is immovable it is mighty say perkins grasped me by the coat sleeve and drew me toward him he whispered excitedly great idea on no to what you may call it water big jug full jug too blamed big yes freight too much yes listen perkins pays the freight he sat down suddenly and beamed upon me joyfully the advertising possibilities of the thing impressed me immediately who could resist the temptation of getting such a monstrous package of glassware by freight free of charge i saw the effect of a life-size reproduction of the bottle on the billboards with perkins pays the freight beneath it in red and the long name in a semicircle of yellow letters above it i saw it reduced in the magazine pages in street cars everywhere great queried perkins yes i admitted thoughtfully it is great he was at my side in an instant wonderful effect of difficulty overcome on the human mind he bubbled take a precipice people look over shudder turn away put in a shoot the shoots people fight to get the next turn to slide down same idea people don't want oh no to thingum bob water hold on perkins pays the freight all right send us a demijohn i saw that perkins was as usual right very well i said what do you want me to do about it perkins wanted a year of my time and all the money i could spare he mentioned twenty thousand dollars as a little beginning a sort of starter as he put it i had faith in perkins but twenty thousand was a large sum to put into a thing on the strength of a name and a phrase i settled myself in my chair and perkins put his feet up on my desk he always could talk better when his feet were tilted up perhaps it sent a greater flow of blood to his brain now about the water i asked comfortably vile cackled perkins gleefully perfectly vile it's the worst you ever tasted you know the sulphur spring taste sort of bad egg aroma well this ono oh to so forth water is worse than the worst it's a bonanza say it's sulphur water with a touch of garlic he reached into his pocket and brought out a flask the water it contained was as clear and sparkling as crystal he removed the cork and handed the flask to me. I sniffed at it and hastily replaced the cork. Perkins grinned with pleasure. Fierce, isn't it? he asked. Smells as if it ought to cure, doesn't it? Got the real old-style Mattery Medica apothecary shop aroma. None of your little pill sugar-coated business about ono to cetera water. Not for a minute. It's the good old quinine, ipecac, calomel, you know when you're taking dose sort. Why say, any man that takes a dose of that water has got to feel better. He deserves to feel better. I sniffed at the flask again and resolutely returned it to Perkins. Yes, I admitted, it has the full legal allowance of smell. There's no doubt about it being a medicinal water nobody would mistake it for a table water perkins a child would know it wasn't meant for perfume but what is it good for what will it cure perkins tilted his pratt hat over one ear and crossed his legs speaking as one chicago man to another he said slowly what do you think of rheumatism if you want me to speak as man to man perkins i replied I may say that rheumatism is a mighty uncomfortable disease. It's prevalent, said Perkins eagerly. It's the most prevalent disease on the map. The rich must have it. The poorest can afford it. The young and the old simply roll in it. Why, man, he exclaimed, 
rheumatism was made specially for ono to so forth water there's millions and millions of cases of rheumatism and there's oceans and oceans of perkins world famous ono to what you call it water great what will cure rheumatism nothing what will ono to so on water cure nothing there you are they fit each other like a foot in a shoe he leaned back and smiled then he waved his hand jauntily in the air but i'm not partial he added if you can think of a better disease we'll cure it anything perkins i said would you take this water for rheumatism would i say if i had rheumatism i'd live on it i'd drink it by the gallon i'd bathe in it he stopped abruptly and a smile broke forth at one corner of his mouth and gradually spread over his face until it broke into a broad grin which he vainly endeavored to stifle warm he murmured and then his grin broadened a little and he muttered lukewarm and grinned again and ran his hand through his hair he sat down and slapped his knee say he cried greatest idea yet i'm a benefactor think of the poor old people trying to drink that stuff think of them trying to force it down their throats it would be a sin to make a dog drink it he wiped an actual tear from his eye what if i had to drink it what if my poor old mother had to drink it cruelty but we won't make em we will be good we will be generous we will be great we will let them bathe in it twice a day morning and night lukewarm why make weak human beings swallow it and besides they'll need more think of enough ono to so forth water to swim in twice a day and good old perkins paying the freight without another word i reached over and clasped perkins by the hand it was a silent communion of souls of the souls of two live up-to-date chicagoans when the clasp was loosened we were bound together in a noble purpose to supply ono to something water to a waiting pain-cursed world we were banded together like good samaritans to supply a remedy to the lame and the halt and perkins paying the freight then perkins gave me the details there were to be three of us in the deal there was a young man from glaubus iowa in chicago running a street car on the north side he had been raised near glaubus and his father had owned a farm but the old man was no financier and sold off the place bit by bit until all that was left was a forty-acre swamp skunk swamp they called it because of the rank water and when the old man died the son came to chicago to earn a living he brought along a flask of the swamp water so that when he got homesick he could take out the cork smell it and be glad he was in chicago instead of on the old place up in the corner of the swamp a spring welled up and that spring spouted onotowatishika water day and night gallons and barrels and floods of it but it needed a perkins the great to know its value perkins smelled its value the first whiff he got he had a rough map of glaubus with the skunk swamp off about a mile to the west we patched up the deal the next day the young fellow was to have a quarter interest because he put in the forty acres and perkins put in his time and talent for half the balance and i got the remainder for my time and money we wanted the young fellow to take a third interest and put in his time too but he said that rather than go back to the old place he would take a smaller share and get a job in some nice sweet spot like the stockyards or a fertilizer factory so perkins and i packed up and went out to glaubus when we got within two miles of glaubus perkins stuck his head out of the car window and drew it back covered with smiles smell it he asked great you can smell it way out here wait till we get on the ground it must be wonderful i did not wonder when the train pulled up at the glaubus station 
that the place was a small dilapidated village nor that the inhabitants were a careworn hopeless expression there was too much onotowatishika water in the air but perkins glowed with joy smell it he asked eagerly great ad you can't get away from it you can't forget it and look at this town look at the bare walls not a sign on any of them not a billboard in the place not an ad of any kind in sight perkins my boy this is heaven for you this is pie and nuts i must confess that i was not so joyous over the prospect i began to tire of anatowatishika water already i suggested to perkins that we ought to have an agency in chicago and hinted that i knew all about running agencies properly but he said that i would get used to the odor presently and in time come to love it and long for it when i was away from it i told him that doubtless he was right but that i thought it would do me good to go away before my love got too violent but perkins never could see a joke and it was wasted on him he walked me right out to the swamp and stood there an hour just watching the water bubble up it seemed to do him good there was no shanty in the village good enough for our office so that afternoon we bought a vacant lot next to the post office for five dollars and arranged to have a building put up for our use and then as there was nothing else for us to do until the next train came along perkins sat around thinking and something always happened when perkins thought in less than an hour perkins set off to find the mayor and the councilman and a notary public he had a great idea they had a park in glaubus a full block of weeds and rank growth and perkins showed the mayor what a disgrace that park was to a town of the size and beauty of glaubus he said there ought to be a fountain and walks and benches where people could sit in the evenings the mayor allowed that was so but didn't see where the cash was to come from perkins told him here we are he said two public-spirited men come over from chicago to bottle up the old skunk spring and make glaubus famous glaubus was to be our home and already we had contracted for a beautiful one-story building with a dashboard front to make it look like two stories if glaubus treated us right we would treat glaubus right didn't the mayor want to help along his city the mayor certainly did if he didn't have to pay out nothing all right then perkins said there was that old skunk swamp we were going to bottle up a lot of the water that came out of the spring and ship it away and that would help to clean the air for the less water the less smell all perkins wanted was to have those forty acres of swamp that we owned plotted as town lots and taken in as the glaubus land and improvement company's addition to the town of glaubus it would cost the village nothing and as fast as perkins got rid of the lots the village could assess taxes on them and the taxes would pay for the park the mayor and the council didn't see but what that was a square deal so they called a special meeting right there and in half an hour we had the whole thing under way but perky i said when we were on the train hurrying back to chicago how are you going to sell those lots they are nothing but mud and water and no sane man would even think of paying money for them why if the lot next the post office is worth five dollars those lots a mile away from it and ten feet deep in mud wouldn't be worth two copper cents sell said perkins sticking his hands deep into the pockets of his celebrated baffin bay pants sell who wants to sell we'll give em away what does the public want something for nothing what does it covet real estate all right we give em real estate for nothing a lot in the glaubus land and improvement company's addition to the town of glaubus free for ten labels soaked from ona to thingum bob water bottles send in your labels and get a real deed for the lot with a red seal on it and perkins pays the freight did it go 
does anything that perkins the great put his soul into go it went with a rush we looked up the rheumatism statistics of the united states and wherever there was a rheumatism district we build the barns and fences we sent circulars and follow-up letters and advertised in local and county papers we shipped the water by single demijohns at first and then in half dozen crates and then in car lots we established depots in the big business centers and took up magazine advertising on a big scale wherever man met man the catchwords perkins pays the freight were bandied to and fro how can you afford a new hat oh perkins pays the freight the comic papers made jokes about it the daily papers made cartoons about it no vaudeville sketch was complete without a reference to perkins paying the freight and the comic opera hit of the year was the one in which six jolly girls clinked champagne glasses while singing the song ending to us no pleasure lost is and we go a merry gait we don't care what the cost is for perkins pays the freight as for testimonials we scooped in twenty-four members of congress eight famous operatic stars eighty-eight ministers and dead loads of others and our lots in the glaubus land and improvement company's addition to the town of glaubus we began by giving full-size dwelling-house lots then we cut it down to business lot size and as the labels kept pouring in we reduced the lots to cemetery lot size we had lot owners in alaska mexico and the philippines and the village of glaubus fixed up its park and even paved the main street with taxes whenever a lot owner refused to pay his taxes the deed was cancelled and we split the lot up into smaller lots and distributed them to new label savers we also sent agents to organize rheumatism clubs in the large cities that was perkins greatest idea but it was too great one morning as perkins was opening the mail he paused with a letter open before him and let his jaw drop i walked over and laid my hand on his shoulder what is it perky i asked he lay back in his chair and gazed at me blankly then he spoke the lame and the halt he murmured they are coming they are coming here read it he pushed the letter toward me feebly it was from the corresponding secretary of the grand rapids rheumatic club it said gentlemen the members of the club have used onotowatishika water for over a year and are delighted to testify to its merits in fact we have used so much that each member now owns several lots in the glaubus land and improvement company's addition to the town of glaubus and feeling that our health depends on the constant and unremitting use of your healing waters we have decided as a whole to emigrate to glaubus where we may be near the source of the waters and secure them as they arise bubbling from the bosom of mother earth we have withheld this pleasant knowledge from you until we had completed our arrangements for deserting grand rapids in order that the news might come to you as a grateful surprise we have read in your circulars of the beautiful and natural advantages of glaubus and particularly of the charm of the glaubus land and improvement company's addition to the town of glaubus and we will come prepared to rear homes on the land which has been allotted to us we leave to-day i looked at perkins he had wilted perky i said cheer up it's nothing to be sad about but i feel that i have been overworking i'm going to take a vacation i'm going to chicago and i'm going to-day but you can stay and reap the reward of their gratitude i am only a secondary person you are their benefactor perkins didn't take my remarks in the spirit in which they were meant he jumped up and slammed his desk lid and locked it banged the door of the safe and grabbing his pratt hat crushed it on his head he gave one quick glance around the office another at the clock and bolted for the door i saw that he was right 
The train was due in two minutes, and it was the train from Chicago on which the Grand Rapids Rheumatic Club would arrive. When we reached the station, the train was just pulling in, and as we jumped aboard, the Grand Rapids delegation disembarked. Some had crutches, and some had canes, some limped, and some did not seem to be disabled. In fact, a good many seemed to be odiously able-bodied, and there was one who looked like a retired coal-heaver. It was beautiful to see them sniffing the air as they stepped from the train. They were like a lot of children on the morning of a circus day. They gathered on the station platform and gave their club yell, and then one enthusiastic old gentleman jumped upon a box and shouted, "'What's the matter with Perkins?' The club, by their loudly unanimous reply, signified that Perkins was all right. But as I looked in the face of Perkins the Great, I felt that I could have given a more correct answer. I knew what was the matter with Perkins. He wanted to get away from the vulgar throng. He wanted that train to pull out, and it did. As we passed out of the town limits, we heard the Grand Rapids Rheumatic Club proclaiming in unison that Perkins was first in peace, first in war, first in the hearts of his countrymen. But that was before they visited their real estate holdings. End of chapter 3 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina